And um, the following, okay, now I'm gonna do the plant of the week real quick. So those of you who go on the Lake Popka Wildlife Drive or most places where there's wetlands are seeing the leafing out and the budding of the Carolina willow, uh, a very common plant in wetlands. And it goes all the way across the United States, Southern United States. It's native and it's an obligate wetland plant. That's the category um, designation from DEP uh, that it needs wetlands. And Doug Tallamy says there are 456 caterpillar species associated with um, willows. And that's why it's such a great place to find birds, warblers, particularly it, there's a big association with the yellow warbler. And yellow warbler is a warbler that just passes through our area. Uh, if we're really lucky, one or two stay for the winter and we always find them on the willows. And here's the Northern Parilla that just come back for the season and it also finds food on the willows. Okay. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna do the mystery bird and I'm gonna play a song and I'm gonna see if you guys can um, guess what it is. And I'm gonna have you tap it in the, type it in the chat box. You ready? All right, Cindy says, morning dove. We do have a couple. I think that one, uh, of course, Audubon. <laughs> but that, I'm looking at the dove. So we do have a dove. And it looks like Peter did get it. It's the white winged dove. So the white winged dove um, has the beautiful arc. I think the picture when it's flying is just gorgeous with that white ring around the tail and the edge. Um, these are found, we can go to the next slide. These are found throughout the South. We have a little established population more on the East Coast, but we do on the West Coast. They do winter on the West Coast. Um, according to what I've read, they're actually supposed to be increasing their range. Um, so, but they are in different places. If you want to find some, you're going to look at Lod, and it's just before the sod fields. There's a lot of reports, and these are all from the eBird. <laughs> you know, looking at the map, you'll find out how to find that later. Downtown, they've seen been seen at Lake Killarney, Orlando Mike, Mountain Bike Park, Barber Park, Lake Gem and Seminole, and in Deltona, the Dewey O'Boster Park. And they do come a lot to bird feeders. I do get mine usually annually at Barber Park, and I'll meet people, and they'll be talking about how they're coming to their feeders. They're like, why are you so excited that come to my bird feeders? So, but those are, it's a beautiful dove. And I think they're also in Gainesville. Who was saying that? Emily said she sees them up in Gainesville. So they are supposed to be moving a little bit farther north. So it's just kind of a nice way to get that another dove in. <laughs> and Lillian says they have, she has them in her yard in Brevard County. Okay. Very good. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start our program. And um, we have this program courtesy of Appalachia Audubon. This is building your eBirding skills to help birds. So there's a connection. You get to use eBird and you're helping birds. And this was Peter Kleinhans and Heather Levy. Forgive me if I mispronounce names. We go to the next one. And your Orange Audubon eBird tutors, Susan, Deborah, myself, Sam, and Jack. And Sam can't be with us tonight, but hopefully he'll be here next week. So, um, so what is, I'm gonna do this to my screen. What is birding? It's active, actively seeking birds, visually and orally. Um, if, if you're new to birding, a lot of birding is done by ear and um, because a lot of times the birds, especially as we're getting into spring and summer, the trees have a lot of leaves on them and you're going to have a hard time spotting them, especially the little tiny birds. So we learned to spot them both by sight and sound. And 
passion and obsession separates the casual bird watcher from the birder, which you'll get into later, but it's all good. So why be a birder? Well, birds are everywhere. So much fun. You, you could find birds wherever you are, whether you're in the city, you're on a farm, you're out in the woods, you're at the beach, they're everywhere. So they're fun to watch. It's definitely, and I think we found in COVID times that it's very good for our mental and physical health. The physical health gets you outside, it gets you, you know, some birds are really hard to find and you might have to hike several miles to see them if you really wanna see them. Um, it's an economical, uh, both personally, because it doesn't cost a lot of money to be a birder. You can spend a lot of money, but you don't have to. And for a conservation standpoint, we're helping conserve birds by spending our money, um, park admission, um, hopefully duck stamps, which actually goes into preserving land. Um, it helps us to be patient and it definitely teaches you to, to observe better. And you find that you're not only noticing birds, but you notice a lot of other things. You notice the bloom cycle of plants, you notice insects, you notice behavior of the birds different times of year, you, you notice, you know, animal tracks. It just, it gets, just it builds. It's very rewarding. It's a lot of fun and you make great friends. And actually that looks like a picture from our, our last survey last week. And we had a lot of fun and we are staying safe. We're wearing masks and we're staying socially distant. We just stayed in that picture for really quick. Okay, next slide. So why use eBird? I've been using eBird since 2013. And eBird is the, the widest database of biodiversity in the world. And I'll have another slide on this in a few minutes, but keep this one up. So all those points of light, and this slide is probably two or three years old, were all places where eBird data has been submitted. So you notice even out there in the middle of the Pacific and in the Atlantic Ocean on cruise ships and on little islands, a lot of people are using it and why? Well, number one, it's fun. Number two, the reason why I started, it helps scientists because scientists who are studying birds and other wildlife, they can't be everywhere. So your, your, your report, even if it's 15 minutes in your backyard is providing valuable data. And if you do it consistently, it's even more valuable. Um, so that's huge. And actually, as we'll learn later in this presentation, it's helped with conservation efforts. So it's a really good thing. And personally, it'll keep your life list for you and you can go back and you can look year to year uh, what species you've seen. It'll help you also if you're doing your yard and you're trying to do habitat improvement. Well, you can track what birds you're seeing and seeing, is it working? Do I need to try something else? So I highly recommend that you use eBird, even if you just do baby steps, because that's how I started. Okay, next slide. So um, everyone's heard, you know, the, the big study that came out with all the birds lost. And by tracking avian population and movements, it's going to help us find solutions. So, you know, forest birds are down 22% since 1970, shorebirds 37% since 1974, and grassland birds are really down since 1970, 53%. So by us doing this data reporting, we're helping. Okay, next slide. So eBird began in 2002. It is one of the largest biodiversity related, related citizen science projects. What citizen science? It's everyday people contributing data to scientists. And there's lots of projects. See, there's ones for rain, there's one for bugs, there's ones for stars, but eBird is awesome. It's international, it's free. It's, it's a, it stores uh, not only your observations, but photos and recordings. Um, and it's a place you can go to see those as well. And if you get really get the birding bug, it's gonna help you find target birds. So let's say you just really, really want to see, um, uh, let's see, a short tail hawk. Well, you can look on eBird and, and find your best places maybe to look, whatever it is that you're looking for. Okay, all right, next. So the first thing you're gonna need to do is you do need to create an account. Um, 
And so you need to go to the website to create the account. Um, it's very simple. And what's really cool about this, once you have a Cornell Lab account, it's going to give you access to everything that's on the left. Bird Academy, which has classes, Birds of the World, which is a really cool resource. Birds of the World does cost, though. Um, Celebrate Urban Birds, Great Backyard Bird Count, the Macaulay Library, which is an amazing place to get uh, photos and sounds, all that. Nest Watch and Feeder Watch. So that one login will work with everything. OK, next one. So you have to say, well, am I going to use my smartphone, website, or both? Well, I'll tell you from personal experience, I use both. Now, when I first started eBird, there was no mobile. So what you would do is you would take your little notepad out in the field and you write down notes and then go back home and put it in. But then you had to try to figure out how far did you go and you had to keep track of your time. So it was, it was a little bit more challenging. Um, with your smartphone, it's going to track where you are. It's going to track your distance and it's going to track your time. So it makes it a little bit easier. And the nice thing about the website is you can upload your recordings and your photos and it is a little easier to navigate. And when you're researching and looking for stuff, the website is a lot easier to use. Okay, next. So I'm going to run through the mobile app real quick. And remember, we're recording this. So most likely um, I'm going too fast. So you can go back at your own pace and go through this. And, and don't forget, if you mess up, it's okay. You know, no one's gonna, the eBird police aren't gonna come say, you put something in wrong. When I first started, I was afraid of making mistakes, but you don't have to worry about that. There's contingencies for that. So this is how you start a checklist on the mobile and you just click that green start. So you can go from there, next, next slide. And it's automatically gonna give you the date and the time. And sometimes like if I see birds and then I'm like, oh, I'm gonna start a list. I can put my time back. I've done that. And you see the little, um, it says record track. I generally would keep that on because if you don't have it on, you don't know how far you went. Now, sometimes if you're where, maybe you're a private property and the people that you're on the private property don't want people coming to look at particular birds, then you wouldn't record your track and you could just set your site somewhere close by. But for the generally record your track and then you hit start. And then what's gonna come up? Well, this is, you know, usually when I start, it's, it's gonna, you know, you can choose your location. So um, there's a place on eBird to choose your location. You can do it after you're done. I usually do it before, cause sometimes I forget. Um, you can have recent places you visited nearby, which I'll show you in a minute, or the map. And the map will show you exactly where you are. So you can do it that way. And if on the map, there's a little like red little balloon thingy. That's a hot spot. And eBird e reviewers prefer that if there's a hot spot that you go ahead and use that because that helps them with their data management. Okay. And I see some questions and I'll, I'll pause in a second. Um, here is, if you go to nearby, it'll list everything. So this is kind of near where I live around here. You notice the ones that are red, like Lake Jump, Boat Park, Boat Ramp, Popka Boat Clare Canal, those are all hot spots, but they might not have necessarily been where I was. So you kind of have to know where you are. And if you're not sure, you can just go from the map. Okay, and let me, let me grab the questions here real quick and go to the next slide. Uh, oh yeah downloaded on private property. Yeah, you can put a comment on private property, um, private. Okay, meat gardens, there is a hot spot. So um, next time you go, just be sure you're on the one where it tracks you. There, there is a hot spot for meat gardens. So this is what it looks like. This is your species list. And it, wherever you put your, you know, uh, your location, it, it'll coordinate the likely birds. So like here in central Florida, the bird list is going to be different than if I was in Canada, the list would be way different. And it has GPS to kind of help you with that. Um, so you look down the list and it is in there um, by taxonomic order. It's not by alphabetical, but there's a way, because if you're new with this, you're like, oh my gosh, do I have to scroll down and find all these birds? It's just too hard. No, there's an easy way. So go ahead to the next slide. 
So all you got to do is type in the first few letters of the bird name. And so for goldfinch, I could have put in A-M-E and it would have, there would be like American goldfinch, American crow, or I typed in G-O-L and it should pop up, okay? And then what you do is see to the left, there's numbers, you can just click and then it just adds it up. And oops, what if you put too many? Well, you can click on it and you can delete it. You can, you know, delete the number and put the right one. So that does happen because we all have, you know, thick fingers and sometimes we hit the wrong things. And if you hit the wrong thing, you can delete it before you send it because we all accidentally hit stuff all the time. Okay, so that's how you find a bird. And sometimes if you get lucky, you get to see a rare bird. So like lately we've been going to some places around where we have woodcock at night and they call and they're really cool. And if you haven't heard one, you should definitely check it out. And after Jack talks, um, you'll kind of know how to find where to find one. So if you put one of those in, do you notice there's an R next to it? That means it's a rare bird. It's either rare because it's the wrong time of year or it's rare because they're not seen a whole lot. Or it could be rare that you just clicked on something that is, <laughs> doesn't belong here like a penguin. So if you say, oh yes, I heard the woodcock. So you're gonna put the number in and then we go to the next, oh, that picture there is the, um, the fork tail flycatcher. We had that at Lake Apopka a few years back. Not, not for a long time though. So here's a rare bird I had not that long ago. And that's my picture. That's the best I could do because that bird didn't want to sit still. So anyways, you are required to put some evidence for what you saw. And you might say, well, I, I'm not sure. Well, put the best you can. It, great. The best thing is if you do get a picture, because from that picture, even though it's not great, you can see it's got the, this is a yellow breasted chat. And it's got the bright yellow breast and it's got white underneath and friend of mine had a much better picture and we all saw it together. Plus this is a, 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 a reoccurring bird. So, you know, I put continuing um, and then put a description, you know, like where it was and a little description of what it, what it, what it looks, what would it look like. And what's really nice if you're trying to help fellow, fellow birders who look for these rare birds, you put a description of maybe where you saw it on the path or what it was doing, because then other people can try to find it. Now, if it's a sensitive species, you don't do that. And we'll, we'll talk about that just a little. Um, so if you accidentally click rare bird and you're like, oops, I didn't mean to do that, you can just delete it, you, you, you know, because that happens. Okay, you can go to the next one. So you want to review your list before you submit, because maybe you accidentally hit something that you didn't see, and you can just delete it off. You, you can sideswipe it or you can just click to where it's zero um, and you go through your whole list and say, yeah, did I see it or not? And if you forgot to add something, you see that little bar, you can type in the name there and you can look. Um, if it's a sensitive species to the right, like painted bunting, like birds that, you know, sometimes not so nice people look at eBird and try to find them so they can catch them. Um, I think it'd just be best. You can report it, that's fine, but it won't show on eBird. So you, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to put a description. Definitely don't put a description. And some people do that with ducks too, because well, hunting season's over, but you know, you can put a general description, but you don't want to make it too easy if someone's looking for negative reasons, but there's not a lot of that. So don't worry about it. So you, you hit review, it's going to show you the list. You say, oh yeah, yep, those are good. I saw those. And then the next screen that you're gonna see is your effort. So if you forgot to record your, your um, hit the record my track, or sometimes, sometimes it just stops. I've had that happen. Um, you can mark, you need to mark, were you traveling? And then you can estimate how far you went. Were you stationary? Sometimes we just, you know, you could sit in the chair on the beach and you'd be watching this, the shorebirds and the gulls. Or incidental, you know, every now and then, you know, you drive up to Target and there's this cool bird, yellow-headed blackbird. You weren't birding, but you saw it, so you put an incidental list in, okay? And then um, make sure that's in there. And also at this point, if you didn't put the location, you can go to location and do what we showed you at the beginning, okay? And then 
you submitted that point. So now I'm going to turn it over to Susan to talk about other things. Great, Kathy. Thanks. I'm going to talk about using the computer. Um, sometimes I use the computer, especially at home things. Um, I do use the phone when I'm out because that's the easiest. But this is real easy to navigate. If you're kind of a paper birder, you're going to go back and use the computer. Um, if that's the way you like to keep your list. Um, it's it's going to go through the same thing. So where do you bird? It's going to have, you can pull it up. It'll save your favorites and they're going to pop up. Or if you need to find it on a map, you can put a little keyword and it'll pop up and you can kind of put a little pinpoint or find a hotspot that's near to it. Um, it's going to talk to you what date was it, what time. It's going to go through that traveling stationary, the same thing she was talking about. Um, a, the time again is down here, how long you birded, the size of your party. And if there's any comments, like sometimes if I'm doing my bird feeder and yard, I'll put down their feeder, bird, feeder and yard birds so that they know exactly what I'm putting it in. Then you, at this big screen will pop up. I don't go through these. You can go over to the right. There's like a, that little um, magnifying glass and you can type in what you're looking for and it's gonna pop up. So then you kind of click that and you can put your number in. So I'll probably start doing the hooded merganser. I think that's a lot easier than looking through these big lists. Now that's not to say sometimes I don't look through a list if I think maybe I forgot something and it kind of reminds me of what I saw if, if it's a big, you know, there's a lot of stuff. And you'll probably put that, is this a complete checklist? And I can check yes and submit it. So we can go to the next slide. So checklists, since these are being used for science um, and research, they like to try to get as quality as you can. So what that means is they'd like you, if you're really going far, to keep your list less than five miles. You don't want to have too long a duration and too long a distance because really you're covering probably a lot of different habitats. And they're going to get more information, more constituted information if you're kind of limiting it. You're gonna to try to use the hotspots when available because on my phone, it's automatically gonna pop up a GPS spot and I'm gonna to need to change it to the hotspot. Unless of course I'm not by one, but I'm gonna to wanna to change it so that they can keep all that data. If I'm, if I'm at Lake Apopka, Wildlife Drive, McDonald Canal, I wanna put that on there so that they know where I'm birding. You can of course create hotspots somewhere that there isn't a hotspot, you might wanna make one. Um, a personal location. Um, you can upload coordinates. I did that one time with someone put in something and I saw the same thing and I just used his. So I put in his coordinates so that they kind of were in the same spot. Uh, next. So one of the things is you do want to try to get all the species you're able to identify by sight and sound to the best of your ability. Now, does that mean you're gonna put every bird you see? <clears throat> I don't know, I'm not that good that everything I see isn't always gonna be able to go into it, but it's really only you're putting in what you can identify. That's the important thing. You do wanna try, if you're in a group, they do like to have one checklist per group. You can add different people and it shares to everyone. It's nice, keeps it convenient. And the other thing that they wanna do is Try not to use an X. If you go to somewhere and there's so many of them and you're like, oh, I don't know. And instead of putting in an X, they're gonna, there is a class, a free class, how to use eBird and it talks about how to estimate the number. So you don't really have to use the X. So some of those things, I think, um, Deborah's gonna mention the name of the class later, there's a free class and it talks about not, how not to use the X. And next. Okay, Merlin is one of the um, apps that you can use to identify birds. We're not going to go over it a lot. It is on our YouTube channel. We did kind of do an in-depth, but this kind of helps you to identify birds. Um, it's a free app. It helps you use, you, if you take a picture, you can kind of copy that picture and it'll give you an idea of what you might be looking at. 
Or let's say you have a question about the bird, you want to look at the range map. Is this what I think I'm seeing? And you can get a lot of interesting birds. You can also, it'll sort it by different sizes, shapes, that type. So kind of a good little app. I would go to that YouTube channel and check that out because I think that's a, a nice app to use. Next. So quality data. So you, your data is going to be reviewed by eBird uh, team reviewers. Um, they're going to want to know things like field marks, behavior, habitat, especially if you see something rare. Um, sometimes you're going to get flagged because you put the wrong photo in. You know, you might put something in and it's obviously a wrong photo and they're going to let you know. So you don't have to worry about being wrong because they'll contact you and you can kind of correct it. And that's a really good thing. They do want to make sure that you put down your description of any rarities, um, uh, especially photos. Really good to be able to have a nice background, especially if you do rarities, if you take a photo makes it a lot easier to explain what you've seen. <laughs> and Cindy says they are so on top of it. Yes, we all get emails occasionally, so next. All right, and I think, um, is this where Jack was gonna start, Hotspots? Jack, are you ready? Unmute. I can do that too. Hey everybody, I'm Jack. Um, if we could do the screen share thing. Okay. And screen sharing, do you want to continue? Yes, I do. And um, yeah, let me start over again. I think we overlapped. Here. Um, does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I go to eBird. This is what pops up. And what I do is I go to this button and I'm going to click on explore. And let's say I want to track down a specific species like piping plover. And this is where I go. It's species map. So I'm going to click on the species map. And then I'm going to enter the species name. And there it is. And now I can, I have a, a scroll wheel on my mouse and scroll in. Otherwise, you would use the plus and minus symbols up here. And let's say I don't really want to drive over to Fort DeSoto. Um, it's a long drive and, and it's just traffic that way just never seems to be nice. So let's say I want to go to the East Coast and let's go here. So you see the blue markers and red markers. Red markers, I believe, are considered a hot spot. And so let's, I'm going to zoom in some more. And where's this? And this is New Smyrna Beach. Well, I've been going to New Smyrna Beach since I was a small child, so I know the way there. And I'm going to click on um, this hotspot and see what's what's going on. So here are all the people that have spotted piping plovers, how many they've seen, and the date. Uh, so it looks like um, it's the most recent one. So I'm going to click on this one. You want to click on the date. Um, and I'm going to open it on a new tab. And come over here. And here's this person's eBird list that they did on this day. I can see they started at 5.30 p.m. I can see they, they went for 45 minutes. They went about a mile and a half. And that's all the information I got from this one. So I'm going to close this tab. And let's go to, let's go to this person. They, they took a picture and it's there. And this is back in December. So again, I'm going to open on a new tab because that's just what I do. And they have all sorts of pictures. And there's a piping plover. And I think they're just incredibly little cute birds. Mm -hmm. um, and let's go. I'm going to X out of the photo. 
And so when did they start? They started at 10, 10, 16 a.m. So it looks like these guys are out there all the time. And they were 55 minutes. They went two miles. Uh, this is where they are. So you can click on this uh, Smyrna Dunes Park. Um, I also at times will do, use Google Maps to figure it out uh, exactly. You know, how do I gain access? You know, do, do I have to pay to go there? I, I, I don't know. Um, so I'll go back to the map again. And oh, look, here's Sam. Let's check out Sam. Here's Sam. And he's got some photos. And Sam started in the morning. Good for Sam. 7.19 a.m., three hours and 10 minutes, 3.25 miles. So for me, this gives me an idea of where I can find a species that I want to go and get photos of and observe it. And I can go and do research and like I've done this with um, red cockaded woodpeckers. Um, I've had more success going south than going north to Ocala as far as actually finding them. But uh, go through and check people's list. And sometimes they leave comments and sometimes they leave very direct comments about you know, where exactly they saw them. Uh, you know, like if they're in the jetties or something. Um, and this is pretty much how I use eBird. Um, and I can, I can X out of this list and I can scroll back. And, you know, these are the two, uh, the two red ones. And here, I'll click on this one. And so you see this box, this is a comment. So they made a comment about piping plovers. So let's go there and look at this one. And they commented on everything and they were foraging and three of them were banded. So that's cool. So that's one thing, if I can get pictures of the bands of birds, I, I, I feel like I'm really helping out because somebody probably held that bird when it was a little baby and, and put those bands on there and they'd really like to know where, where is that baby now? And it's an adult and how's it doing? And um, I, I've done that with uh, some snail kites at Lake Apopka recently. Uh, one of them's K8, she's three years old. Um, but anyway, this is this is how I use eBird. So, thanks. Uh, I should unshare now. I take it. You can go back. Let's go back to the other one if you want to carry on. Let's see. And that's that. Okay. Do you want to carry on for a little while? Um. Or I can do it. Continue. Yeah. Thanks. Explore hotspots. So if you're on the explore page, you saw he how he looks at the species maps. You can also look at like parks or the hotspots. So go ahead to the next. If you click this one, um, it's going to bring you up a map. Sometimes you have to kind of focus in to get away from those squares that you saw on Jack's map to get all these little hotspots. Um, the redder the hotspot, the better it is. That means there's more things seen there. So we kind of like those. Um, St. Mark's, nice red spot. It's going to tell you all the things that are recently seen there. Um, and overall, they've had 334 species there. Um, go ahead and go next. Regions, you can also explore by regions. Let's say you want to look up Orange County and see what's there. Alachua County, you would put something in and it's going to bring up what's in that area. You can go next. So it's going to bring up this page. Um, I think on their sample, they used Pima. I can't read that because of Arizona, but it's going to give you all the sightings and where the location, what they've seen, how many they've seen, who the birder was or the person who put it in. There's also a list on the side that's kind of kind of go over all you the top 100 there. Um, there's also going to be on the same page rare bird alert so you can see what's been happening there on rare birds the last seven days in this county. Recent visits in this county. So these are going to be some of the birders what they've seen. Top e birders if you really like to compete. Me Molly. Pollock has seen 431 species in this area. So pretty good birding there. And then the top hotspots are gonna be listed also. So those are a good idea of where to go to seabirds because there's a lot of them there. Next. 
And then species map, that's what Jack did um, already. And he kind of showed you that. So we can go to the next. It kind of gave you a nice thing. And he talked about it. And again, um, the redder is the more recent sightings. So those are going to be the ones that are going to be a little bit better. If you're looking for like the brown headed nut hatch, you want to kind of look at the red ones because the, the older sighted. Rose, Susan. Okay, we'll do target species. Um, it's a very cool thing that eBird can do where it provides a species list. It provides species needed for a particular list and it sends you alerts and needs that are based All right, there we go. Okay, targets. Actually, so for some people who like to find out what's a bird I haven't seen, you can actually set up a target and they'll kind of let you, give you a little, you can do an email um, and it'll let you know when those are seen. I don't particularly use them, but I know Kathy uses it a lot to get different birds if she's looking for something and it'll pop up and she kind of give her an idea. You can set these alerts by target species or maybe by rare birds. So you might be able to do it by counties, by the state. You could do it however you kind of, they give you a couple different options so that you can select these things. You can do ABA rarities only. So if you wanna find out more exciting birds, you're gonna set something up to take a look at these or you can go online and just view them. I think that's what I do, I just view them when I'm interested, because that way I don't get too tempted to go out every, <laughs> chasing every bird. Next. All right. And then the media. Um, the Macaulay Library has been set up and that is um, an archive for all of the, it keeps all the photos and audio files that you download. If you have a question about any bird, you can look through a million pictures, that's wonderful. Um, it's over 13, what, what, 1,373 publications use the, some of the pictures and that that are in this library and they use it for research. I think we talked about that education and conservation. Um, so eBird and science. So some of the things that they're using all this eBird for, I, again, you wanna try to do complete check lists. They do collect year-round information on species, um, species distribution models. Um, they just talk about a full life cycle. So a lot of the different things you can look at on the different birds. Again, a lot of this research on the bottom left, it talks about basic things that they're using this information on. Next. they have cool things. It's just fun to go on this website, look around. They do have abundance maps. Let's say you wanna, you're thinking of, you see, saw a wood thrush. Eh, I might wanna check the map to make sure it's here at this time of year. These will play and it will show you where they migrate through this map will change when you click it. And for every month, it's gonna show you where this thrush is when it's migrating through Florida, if it migrates through Florida and where it winters. So some of the things that they've used it for are new nesting sites of tricolored blackbirds. They found people put that in there. They prioritized the Nova Scotia Nature Trust. Some of this information has been used to optimize mowing practices for birds in a grassland, kind of cool. Power line retrofitting to make sure to protect our birds. The proper placement for wind energy, very important, especially if it's on any type of um, throughway, flyway where the birds are going by. And also Florida State Parks have used the information to decide to ban drones. So, and there's many other studies that they're using it for. Next. Deborah's gonna take over from here and talk to a little bit about the land trust.
Deborah Frozen. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yes. Hey. Oh, okay. Um, so um, Orange Audubon is part of a land trust grant that was initiated by Appalachia Audubon. We got Peter who, uh, Kleinhans who initiated that on the line. And um, what it is, is there's three land trusts and four Audubon chapters collaborating on it. And we're doing monitoring visits to properties either with conservation easements by these land trusts or owned by these land trusts. And these field trips include the public. And they're actually through the grant. This grant came from Cornell Lab of Ornithology through Appalachia Audubon. And there are prizes for the first 10 people, new e-birders that complete e-bird training and submit a checklist. And um, so the partners here are, it's the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is what, developed eBird and also all about birds that we all find whenever we Google a bird, that's the first thing that comes up and we have so much good information. And the land trusts are Conservation Florida that we're partnering with, Orange Audubon is, uh, conserveflorida.org. And I'm gonna introduce Lillian from Conservation Florida in just a minute. And then Tall Timbers is the land trust in north of Tallahassee, uh, the oldest. Um, and that's what Peter is associated with. And then Alachua Conservation Trust does work around Alachua County. And the chapters involved are Orange Audubon Society, and you know how to find us, orangeaudubonfl.org, West Volusia Audubon, because the property is that we're going to be visiting is in Deltona. So we're collaborating with West Volusia. And Appalachia, here's their website, and Alachua, here's their website. And uh, the first 10 people who take this eBird Essentials class and uh, successfully pass it um, and notify us, and um, you first go ahead and send it to us at Orange Audubon, info at orangeaudubonfl.org, and we'll pass it off to Peter. And those first 10 people uh, will be able to get a National Geographic field guide. So um, that's the little perk we got going with this grant. And um, the field trip is, I'm gonna turn this now over to Lillian from Conservation Florida. Um, and she will tell about their property, what they do and the field trip. Hello everyone. You see this? Did I share it correctly yet or not yet? No, not yet. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Like Deborah said, my name is Lillian Dinkins. I'm one of the fellows here at Conservation Florida. And tonight I'll just tell you all a little bit about Conservation Florida, what we do in the state of Florida, and some really exciting upcoming events that we have. Next slide. Somebody okay. needs to be muted. Is that, would that be you You're in the background of you, Lillian, or somebody else? Please mute if, if, if that's your background. Okay, go on. Okay, um, so just a little introduction about Conservation Florida. We are a, a accredited land trust. So land trusts are just nonprofit organizations that actively work to conserve land. Um, we do this a number of different ways. We acquire land or conservation easements. And with these lands, we manage them and conserve them. And by us being accredited, that just means that we're a really strong, effective organization and you can trust us with conserving land. Next slide. This is a little tricky the way I'm doing it. Okay, yeah. Okay, and this is just our staff. Um, a lot of great people who work on uh, in this staff in Conservation Florida. We wear a lot of different hats, are able to do a lot of different stuff just with eight people and our numbers are growing bigger and bigger. Next slide. Um, these are also our board of directors. Um, all of these people live in different parts of Florida, but all have a love for conservation and are just a really good asset to our organization. Next slide. 
So just what do we protect? So Conservation's Florida mission is just to save Florida's natural and agricultural landscapes for future generations. Our conservation projects support Florida's native plants and wildlife, our freshwater, conservation corridors, family farms and ranches, and also the economy and nature-based recreation. Next slide. So just to show you some nice pictures, of what we do, we save nice forests. Next. Springs, rivers, and watersheds. Next. Places that you enjoy to go see nature, especially birding. Next. We save healthy habitats for wildlife. Next. Wildlife itself by connecting the corridors that they need to survive. Next slide. And at the end of the day, we are saving land for the future generations. Next slide. So a little bit about where we work. The one really cool thing about our organization is all of those team members that you saw, we live in different parts of Florida. So we were um, started in 1999. And since then, we've been able to save over 25,000 acres of land um, by acquisition, facilitation, or incubation of conservation projects. Next slide. So we do this by focusing on different parts of Florida. So someone like myself, I live in Orlando, but the work that we do here in Orlando provides the corridors to places like Tampa and Ocala, and we get to connect those places by the corridors and saving those areas. Next slide. And we are not the only conservation organization within Florida. So we make sure that we're mindful of other organizations and the counties that they're working in. So we do have our priority areas, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, in other counties, we work case by case. And we also do still partner with other organizations who care about conservation in those areas. Next slide. So going to the three um, areas that we really have a priority in. We focus in Northwest Florida, which has some springs, rivers, longleaf pine habitats. Central Florida, which has all of those great things. And also the rare sand pine scrub habitats. And the Northern Everglades, which has all of those as well. And what's really um, special to me since I've been working here, the Avon Park Air Force Range. It's a really cool project. Next slide. So these are just a few pictures of different lands that we've been to throughout Florida in the Everglades headwaters, Central Florida and Northwest Florida. And it's just incredible to see what we can do by saving land um, from not being developed. Um, we use different strategies to um, just help save these lands. We apply for grants and funding sources so that way we have the money to do all of this work. And we're also even purchased some land or we are accepting donations for land. We also help um, people with their own private property, giving them just the encouragement and management plans for their land as well. Next slide. So at the end of the day, Conservation Florida is always about protecting biodiversity for Florida. Um, it's our main goal. It's not just for us, it's for the future generations. Next slide. And you cannot save land without talking to people. So we are also very deeply rooted in community and programming to connect people and nature. Um, we do this in a lot of different ways. So next. Uh, one big thing that we do is our advocacy and just education. So we are able to meet up with different leaders or different counties and just talk about and try and implement different ways that they can conserve better land or just nature aspects in those counties. Next. Our education and outreach, we have so, so many different projects that we have. Our bio blitz, which is something that's very fun. Um, we uh, connect with people even in their backyards, selling them that, you know, you don't have to go far to see nature. It's literally in your backyard. We've also started a trivia game, which is just a fun, just unwinding and seeing different um, nature aspects that are here in Florida. We had a trivia game last Thursday and it was just all about birds. So this month is just about birds for us. Next slide. And also, we just want to share the joy that we have with nature. So sharing nature brings us all joy. 
Um, we really want to be the gap between people and nature and giving them an experience in the areas where they can come outside and see conservation efforts. Next slide. So um, one of the projects that I have been working on since I've been here, I've been here since July, is our D-Ranch Preserve. This is a beautiful, beautiful preserve. It's 476 acres in Volusia County, Deltona. And here we have um, started, well, when I first began here, we started the process of our management plan. So now we're putting in um, the steps in the process to making this area more natural, um, being able to bring back endangered species, um, different types of birds, we're just trying to get the land back to its natural um, state. So we are having our very first um, event out on D Ranch Preserve this Saturday. We are partnering with Orange Audubon, Tall Timbers, and West Volusia, and we're so, so excited. We'll be having our eBird bird watching event. Um, this is our very first event that's open to the public. And with this, we're just, we just want to see the community of birds that we have there. Um, D Ranch Preserve has um, so many oak trees and long leaf pines, different types of pines, and we know we have the birds out there, and we really want to let other people enjoy that aspect as well. So this event is for beginners, intermediates, experts. We all want to just come out there and just learn something about D Ranch Preserve. Next slide. So with that being said, I really hope that um, we could see some of your faces on Saturday. We have three slides left. So in the group chat, I am going to put the event right. You do have to register for this event because we do have to cut it off for a max because of COVID reasons. But this will not be the last event that we have out there. We will have cleanups. We will have different types of events just to get the community and the public out there. Thank you. Um, we're really looking forward to that trip on Saturday and three slots left. And if you can't make it into that trip, we are going to do several other times out there. Okay. Lillian, I have a question. Have they been doing any as far as trails? What, what kind of development or what have they been doing with the property to get ready for this? Um, so yes, this this property, we've had it since 2019. So we've been doing a lot of different trail work, cleaning. Last weekend, we were able to do a smaller just um, clean up around the area. There are a lot of things, you know, how people see properties and they feel like they can dump stuff on properties. Um, so we've done nice cleanups over there, a lot of different trail work. And um, right now we do have cows out there. So they kind of help guide our paths in certain different trails and directions. So it's a work in progress, yes. Do you plan to open it to the public fairly soon? Um, that is to be determined. Um, we're, we're definitely looking for a lot of different events and things that we can actually do out there. We're really trying to reach the community, especially in West Felicia. So we'll be focused on different community aspects um, to do their ID ranch. Um, actually, there is a question from Peter. He's asking, is there an eBird hotspot for the D Ranch Preserve? Or, and he says, if not yet, we should make one before the event. We definitely should, because I don't think we do have one. Very good recommendation. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Peter, do you want to say anything about the grant and, and how it's been going in with the other areas? You can show yourself. We'd love to have you. Sure. Um, can you guys see me okay? I can't see myself, so I can't tell. Yeah, we can, we can see you. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, uh, that was a great presentation from, from all of you. Um, really impressive. Uh, I'm eager to check out. I wish I could make it this weekend to D Ranch, but I'm hoping to go sometime. But um, I guess just you guys covered the grant and, and eBird so well. Um, we so far have done uh, nine property visits as part of this grant. And our goal originally was to record 
at least 10 state wildlife action plan listed birds um, through this project and we are up to 16 species. So it's going quite well. Uh, we've engaged a lot of landowners, a lot of uh, Audubon folks from App Alachua Audubon, Appalachia Audubon, and obviously y'all's uh, chapters. So we're just really excited and it's, it's great to see, um, you know, all the events and, and all the interest in eBird and, and birding because the bottom line with all this is that every single one of us, whether you can identify like five species, 10 species or 60 species, anything you enter into eBird is contributing to conservation. So it really is important and um, it's, it's cool to see interest. And I, I just hope that um, all of you take advantage of these opportunities to see these conservation lands that you might not see otherwise. So thanks uh, for doing this. Thanks for getting the grant. Great opportunity to get out in areas that hadn't been birded before to contribute to science and um, get some new people into birding. So particularly if you're new and if, if we don't fill it up with people that are new, we'll let some of our um, old um, experienced birders join us on Saturday, but uh, there are three slots and we hope uh, to get them filled by the evening. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? So Lily, you have a question and just to let um, everyone know that this is a recorded Everything will be recorded and it will be on our Orange Audubon YouTube channel. So if you want to watch it, if you want to go back and take a look again, we do have some of the other eBird app, or not eBird, but some of the other apps like the Merlin. We didn't go in depth on that, but it does. We do have a YouTube video on that app too. And you can kind of learn a little bit about how to use that to help identify birds so that you can put it into your eBird. And the class that you have to take and pass is eBird Essentials. And I showed that briefly how to find that. That was under the Explore tab, right, Susan? Yes. At the So scroll down to the bottom of the Explore tab to get to eBird Essentials. And it's a, it's a well-designed class from Cornell, broken up into these three minute videos and then you answer the questions. And uh, it, it isn't duck soup to, to pass. <laughs> I didn't pass the first time, and but uh, it, it, you'll learn a lot, and and that's just the beginning of, of the classes that they have online. Cornell does, so check that out if you're starting out, and if you're one of the first ten to submit to us that you completed it, um, you can get this perk of a of a National Geographic uh, guide that was purchased under the grant. 